Hello world, it's me. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to add a heartbeat LED to this Miller Technology M80 board. And I also wanted to add a reset switch so I can do a reset after this Z80 latches up when I first apply the power. And when I added the heartbeat LED, I wanted to do that without taking any of the IO pins out of this INS8154. Since this is the only IO available on this board, there's only 16 pins. This has two 8-bit ports. And that's all the I.O. available on this board. And I didn't want to consume some of that with just, you know, something as simple as a heartbeat. But the heartbeat's really useful. You can, you know, do various things with that through your code to make sure that your code is working as you're expecting. So the question is, how can you go about creating a one-bit control signal output on the Z80? What's the simplest way to do that? Many people aren't aware that the Z80 has a nearly undocumented output port that's built into it, and it's typically unused. It's there pretty much free for the asking. So back in video 63, I hinted at, and then in video 64, I described how the value of the refresh register is output to the low byte of the address, meaning address 0 through 7, during every refresh cycle. The Z80 is designed to operate and refresh dynamic memory at the end of every opcode fetch, while it's processing that opcode, the Z80 has nothing else to do, so it goes out and it refreshes this memory by putting an address out, and it also toggles its refresh line. And then in video 64, I showed how the refresh register load command, load R from A or you know, LD R comma A, copies the contents of the accumulator to that refresh register so you can control what value is sent out to do the refresh. And most importantly, the eighth bit of that refresh register is not changed by any other processor operation, meaning it'll remain at that set value until you do another load R from A operation. No matter what else is going on in the code, with every opcode fetch, for a couple of T states, the value of A7 is controlled by that register bit that is doing absolutely nothing else. And with the use of a latch, A7 can be used to create this one bit output pin that's exclusively under software control. So it's always been there for the taking, yet it's rarely utilized. Uh, I'm not sure that I've ever seen it utilized in a commercial product. And But if you've seen it utilized to create an output pen, you know, please be sure to share the details of that in the comments below. What I think we'd all be interested in that. All right, so the issue, of course, is that this bit is only presented on two or four T-states in each instruction cycle. So two T states in a one byte opcode and four T states in a two byte opcode. So the output has to be latched only when it's valid. And in this case, I'm using a little D type uh, edge triggered latch to do that. I'm using half of a 7474 dual latch to create this heartbeat LED. And in this latch, I only need to use the D input and the clock inputs. I don't need to use the preset and the clear. So the preset and the clear, I both just have wired to five volts to inactivate those. And you could use a simpler latch. This is just what I had available. As I mentioned, there's a current limiting resistor from the five volt rail through the LED. And then the cathode of the LED is just connected to the inverted output or the Q bar output. For the time being, I'm just periodically toggling this bit as a part of the confidence test that I've got running in this little board that I'm starting to develop a confidence test and some other software tests. So I just have a delay loop now that's toggling this thing off and on. Probably at some point I'll put on either a real-time clock with an interrupt or just a little, uh, you know, like a 555 to periodically interrupt the Z80 so I can service that as an interrupt rather than just have a delay loop in that. The concept is easy enough. The only real issue is what to use for that D input to latch that A7. The not refresh line, there's the not memory request, or there's something more complicated that creates a truly decoded or a truly appropriate strobe. And we can look at the Z80 timing diagram. It gives us the answer. Like a normal address, the refresh line is only guaranteed valid while the not memory request is low. So we can see that during a refresh cycle, there's a low going strobe in the not memory re refresh. And during that period of time, the address is valid. But obviously the memory request itself can't be used because it toggles with every memory read. So your latch would wind up capturing, you know, every memory bus cycle. And that's not what we want. We only want the bus cycle during a refresh. So the refresh signal is key since it only strobes load during a memory refresh cycle. 
but the Z80 technical manual specifically warns against using the refresh signal. Now they could have easily made it so that the refresh signal was the only thing needed, but they didn't. You have to drag in the both the memory request and the refresh signal. So let's look at the timing diagram to see. We're not interested in any bus cycle or control line except for the refresh cycle that during the T3 and T4 states. So we can get by with just looking at these two lines. And in fact, if you note that the read and write lines do not strobe during the refresh cycle. And that's intentionally because that protects normal memory from being selected and either putting things onto the bus or corrupting it by reading something off of the bus inadvertently. So if we look at these two signals, if we logically or the not memory request and the not refresh, we can see that the output would be held high at least until this refresh signal falls. But we can see the refresh goes low right at that T2, T3 transition. And there's some other things going on with the memory request. So we need to be very careful to make sure that there's not going to be a glitch during that transition between the second and third T states. And this is very important because if we've got a glitch at that point, that's before the refresh address is even put onto the bus and that's what we would latch. We may, of course, latch the correct thing a little later, but if this was used for a critical application, we need to make sure we're not going to get a glitch. We can see that after the T2 bus cycle of an opcode fetch, not memory request goes high and is guaranteed to be high before the not refresh goes low to initiate the refresh cycle. So in other words, if we OR these two together, the ORed output will be held high by the refresh alone during T1 and T2 while the memory request is actively doing other things latching an opcode, for example. But then at the transition between the T2 and the T3, the ORD output will be held high by both the refresh and now the memory request as it goes back high. And then at the beginning of the T3, it'll be held high by the memory request alone. But we're now into the refresh and the re memory request is, of course, the only indication of a valid address being on the bus. So once we've kind of enable this whole thing using the refresh signal, now we only want to use the memory request to latch this value. So when it strobes low, it's okay to sample and capture the value on that address bus. At the end of the refresh cycle, memory request goes high, and this low to high transition is, my case, I'm using that to clock on the positive edge triggered D-type latch. Since the memory address is guaranteed stable, until after memory request has gone high, we're guaranteed to capture the correct value of A7. And we could use a standard latch or a transparent latch. Either one would suffice. We can use rising edge, falling edge, level triggered. It really is not critical as long as we're using this memory request signal. So the end result is that with a simple OR gate, memory request will only become visible to the latch during a refresh cycle. And then the memory request will be used as the deciding factor of when to latch that address. So that's exactly what we want. And as luck would have it, when I was reverse engineering this board and I was probing around to see how this was decoded and I had to go and see what was in this OR gate, I noticed that on this board, there's an unused OR gate in this 7432. And I could, I could verify that without having to probe the entire board by just holding this up to the light. And I could see that there were no traces going to the fourth gate in this. I was very fortunate in that I had an OR gate already available on this board. I simply took those two signals, the refresh and the memory request, ordered them together with that, and that's what I'm using over in the clock input on this latch. But before I remembered that there was an unused OR gate in this, I got to wondering, how critical is that timing? And I know they said don't use the refresh signal, but how critical is that timing if it came down to adding a gate just for that LED? You know, I got to wondering, would it be good enough? Could I get that to work without any glue logic? Let's look at this rising edge of the clock. We can see that from that rising edge, there's two things of interest. The first thing of interest is, what is the delay until we get a rising edge of the refresh? And so we can look at the AC timing diagram and the numbers that go along with that. And we can see that the rising edge delay, which is TDH of RF, from that clock going high until the refresh goes high is 120 nanoseconds. Okay, so that clock goes high, and then a maximum of 120 nanoseconds, that refresh goes high. 
And, you know, they didn't give us a minimum. They don't give us a typical. They only give us a maximum. So what's the maximum delay for that refresh to go high? On that same clock pulse, sometime after that, it's releasing the address bus. And we can see in the same data, it says that the address is floated at T F of A D, which is 90 nanoseconds after that rising edge of the clock. Then once it's floated, there's a little bit of a delay until the values become invalid. And so we can look at two more values. There's TCAF and TCA. And the difference between those is five nanoseconds. So that says that from when they first switched this into tri-state, we have 90 plus five, which is 95 nanoseconds until the address is invalid. So the upshot is that by the time the not refresh goes high, the address on the address bus has been invalid for at least 25 nanoseconds. But of course, the actual time is up to all sorts of variables like the system inductances, capacitance, how hard it's loaded, and all sorts of other things. So it would be entirely shoddy engineering to use the refresh signal alone to latch A7. Nonetheless, there's all sorts of propagation delays and system variables, and I was interested to see with this particular system, what does it actually do? How, how dodgy would it actually be to just use the refresh signal to latch that rather than go through an OR gate? I mean, after all, the address bus is being floated and the refresh signal is being driven because the address bus is just going into tri-state. Refresh signal is actually being driven the whole time. So even if they switched at the same time, there may be a chance that the refresh bus will transition quicker than the high capacitance address line. And you remember the address line, it's first floated and then it has to be taken out of tri-state and recovered and given a new value. So there's four combinations when the address line is released between T4 of the opcode fetch machine cycle and when the address is put onto the bus in T1 of the next machine cycle. Okay, so the four things that can happen is we could have had a high value for the address line in T4 and then a high value T1 in the next machine cycle. So we could have had high to high, or we could have gone from a low value to a low value, or high to low or low to high, right? Those are the possibilities during this transition. So when the address is released, depending on the collective pull-up tendencies of all the devices attached to the address bus and so forth, it may tend to float high. So we would expect that in a high to high transition, we can be fairly confident that even if we do a late read, we will probably get the correct value, even if it's a bit you know, inadvertent we might get the correct value. We probably will get the correct value. We would also expect maybe that for a low to low transition where the bus is just being released and it's allowed to float, but then it's going to be reset back to low in the T1, we may also be able to get by with a little bit of a late read there and still get, you know, in, and still inadvertently get the correct value. So we can probably get away with late reads in either a high to high or in a low to low transition case. So the tricky bits are going to be in a high low transition or low to high transition. And the expectation is, is there enough propagation delay, meaning the time it takes to re-enable the address tri-state drivers and for the new logic level to be present on the address bus. So is there enough propagation delay for us to latch that value before it actually assumes the new value? For this, we can get enough timing accurately with just a logic analyzer. We don't need to use a scope. So on the logic analyzer, we've got the digital values of the refresh and A7 down here at the bottom. And then below that, we're capturing the analog values also. If we look at a high to high, just as expected, there's a small amount of noise in the address line, but nothing significant. So for a high to high, a late transition would be absolutely fine. The same is true for low to low. And I was quite surprised. I thought that we would start to see the address lines drift a little bit more on a low to low transition, but in fact, the low to low transition is cleaner than a high to high transition. On both the high to high and a low to low transition, we wouldn't have a problem. We can do a little bit of a late read and we would get a correct value. So let's look at the high to low transition. In this, in a high to low transition, the logic analyzer in this particular step is giving 30 nanoseconds. So in other words, the refresh line went high 30 nanoseconds before the address line changed to its ultimate low output. Okay, so in that 30 nanoseconds would be enough for us to capture that latch. But, you know, if we look at the analog signals, 
we can see that you know these are both on the move. This is a bit of a photo finish between those two of which is going to win. And if we go on and look at a low to high transition, so where it was low, but now the address line is going to go high, we can see that we only have you know half or a third of that. We've only got 10 nanoseconds. And then by looking at the analog values, we can see that this is really just depends on the bounce because you know this could easily have gone the other way. So in the end, I might say that, okay, using the refresh, it just might work in this particular situation where it's just an LED. And if you don't catch it this time, you might catch it next time. But it really does depend if the next address that's going out on the bus has a high bit or a low bit there. But in no way would it be reliable and it's subject to all sorts of system upsets and variances. But that's the information you can use at your own peril. So there you have it. You can add a one bit output control pin for the cost of a 74 LS74, which is, you know, 55 cents or whatever from Newark. And actually it's only the cost of half of that because I, this is a dual and I'm only using one of the latches inside that. So, you know, for two bits, you can add a one bit output pin. And another point of interest is, you know, even if you don't want to latch that data using the most significant bit of the refresh register, it was a good way for someone to obfuscate their programming signature into the code. So what you would do is during initialization or something like a bit banging to an output, you would just slip in a few load R from A instructions into that code and you know, maybe with a with a obscure comment or something, and you know, no one would really notice it. But you could then come back to a piece of hardware, and without looking at any of the code, you could put an oscilloscope on that A7, trigger it on the refresh, and look at it right before that refresh. And if it's putting out your unique signature pattern, you can be pretty sure that somebody has lifted that code from you without even understanding exactly what was going on in it. As they say in late night TV, Ginsu knife pitch. But wait, there's more. If the refresh register is presented on the lower eight bits, it begs the question, is anything useful being presented on the high eight bits of the refresh cycle? Well, the answer is a definite yes. The special registers in the Z80 are all 16-bit registers and R is only the low half of that special purpose register. So what's on the high byte during that refresh? Well, the high byte of that 16-bit register is another software controlled register, and specifically it's the vector interrupt address or register I. For simplicity, during a refresh cycle, the entire contents of that 16 bit register are placed on the address bus. So the R register is the low half that we already talked about, and the I register is the high byte. So this means that unless you're using interrupt mode two on the Z80, the I register can be used as a full eight bit output port whose value goes on to the high byte of the address bus during a refresh cycle. And then that byte can be latched in the same manner, at the same time and using the exact same decoding and latch described earlier for the A7 line from the refresh register. So that's easily accomplished with an eight bit edge triggered latch like the 74574, or you could actually latch both A7 and A8 through 15 if you used a nine bit latch, like the 74854 or something, if you happen to have one. And I have that set up on this. What I've got is a little 74574 latch, taking that output from that latch, and I have some LEDs and a little SIP resistor pack here for current limiting. And all I'm doing in the code is at the same time I refresh the heartbeat LED, I take whatever value happens to be in the refresh register and I load that into the I register. So with every heartbeat output, I'm basically just capturing a snapshot of what's in the R register and I'm outputting it to these eight LEDs. So I haven't decided yet if I'm gonna go ahead and, and either take this off and put on a nine bit latch or put this eight bit latch over here also and maybe put some LED outputs on this, just so I have something that, you know, in the code, it's always handy to throw things out to the LEDs so you can see what's going on. So there you have it. You can get a free nine bit output port. It's already in the Z80, it's there for the taking, and it's just with the addition of an OR gate and a latch. And there's a good chance that in whatever your design is, there's already an OR gate sitting around and maybe even a latch. That's it for this video. I appreciate you watching. I hope you found it interesting or learned something, and I look forward to any comments you might have. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.